Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Uh, we're so proud to have this exhibition of Avel Denai, uh, one of the major artists of the last half of the 20th century. And uh, his dates, to 20, 1923 to 1999, fortunately, he didn't make it into the, uh, the 21st century. But we have here today uh, his cousin, Steve Tyson, who is a uh, scholar and Fulbright scholar and uh, professor and curator and artist himself. So Steve is going to speak to, speak to you now about his cousin, Abel Knight. Thank you, Bill. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, this gathering is special in many different ways. It's not only the celebration of Abel Knight, an artist who has been too long neglected, uh, he's an artist who's a supreme artist. As you, those of you who have taken the time to look at his work, you can see that you're in the presence of a master. Um, Abel was more than just uh, 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 an artist that uh, is revered among his peers and so forth, but he was also family, as my mother uh, mentioned. And I'm, I'm, I feel so blessed that my mother is here, first cousin to Abel. That generation is very important. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, that in a moment. The first time I met Abdel was actually 60 years ago. Uh, and um, it was at my birthday party. And he had just come back from France. He spent a lot of time in France after the Second World War. Uh, Abdel was born in 1923, as Bill said, uh, in an area that is now occupied mostly by Lincoln Center. It's known as San Juan Hill. I don't know how many of you have heard of San Juan Hill. Right? You know about that. All right. Uh, West Side Story was filmed just you know, north of that, that region. Um, that community was inhabited by a number of different groups coming from the Caribbean islands, from the south. You might have heard of uh, a young man coming to that area by the name of Thelonious Monk. Mm -hmm. You might have heard of James P. Johnson. All right. Abel, that generation, my mother's family came to that area. My father's family came to that area uh, on 63rd Street. Fifth Houses. Fifth Houses. 210 West 63rd Street is where Abel grew up. Uh, he had three other siblings. He had, the oldest was Dolorita. Uh, the second was uh, Edgar, or known as Rene. And, uh, and then there was Francis, and then Abel was the youngest of those. Now, interestingly, now, we're talking about the early 1920s. Um, Dollar Reed was born a bit earlier than that. But the point is, is that they were all interested in the arts in some way or another. Abel came from a family where his father, Randolph, or Rando as we call him, and his mother, Antipas, who had come from Puerto Rico, Rando from Barbados, they were supportive of their children. They were supportive of them. I'm just trying to give you an idea of the nurturing environment that he grew up in. So, Dolorita was interested in fashion design. They supported that. Uh, Edgar Rene was interested in music, and he became an arranger. An arranger for what group? Anybody heard? Mm -hmm. The Delta Rhythm Boys. <laughs> Number one, and the pianist. And then followed by. He was a musical director, live performances for The Fifth Dimension. And my brother and I remember that uh, very well because <laughs> there used to be a hotel uh, called the uh, Americana, off of 7th Avenue, and The Fifth Dimension was performing there. And Rene had it in his mind to invite uh, his two <laughs> cousins to come up on stage, my brother and I, to dance with The Fifth Dimension. <laughs> um, I'll talk more about Rene. Uh, and then uh, the Francis was interested in dance. So Abel, uh, being the youngest, uh, one of the things that Francis told me one time is that his mother, Antipas, used to do a lot of, the, made a lot of clothes. She'd do a lot of sewing, you know, making clothes and things. And when she was working, she would sometimes, in cutting fabric, she would, the pieces would drop to the floor. And Abel would go and he would collect these pieces of colorful fabric and he would start arranging them and creating like a work of art. And one of the things that Francis said that she knew even then that he had an eye for color. And I think that's quite evident in many of the works here. So that was the, the, the beginning, the roots of it. 
All right, the years go on, and eventually uh, Bell uh, enters Benjamin Franklin High School, uh, and it's located on 100 and I believe it's 116th Street, right? And uh, he be, excels to become one of the best artists. In fact, he became the president of the art club at Benjamin Franklin. He graduates from there. Oh, by the way, one other important thing. I talked about how nurturing the family was. His father worked for a company called Arthur Brown and Sons, and they were located in Midtown Manhattan. They produce art supplies, and so his father would come home with these supplies and he would give them to Abel. And Abel would do this little thing there, and he's number three in the sixth grade. And so finally, um, he would, his father would then take some of the drawings that Abel did, and he would show them to some of the clients. Right? So he was getting this, this feedback, he was getting the support. All right, so now he's at Benjamin Franklin High School, uh, excels there, and he graduates to enter Pratt Institute. He wants to be a commercial artist. Um, and then something called the Second World War interrupts that, and he winds up going into the army and serving in France. And he talked about going to France and spending time with some of the families. He would take his drawing pad, and I had, I found a small drawing pad where he was drawing some of the streets and the villages and the towns and some of the army depots and so forth. And it's, uh, it's really quite, quite interesting. And even then, his skill level was just impeccable. All right. But this idea of France stays in his mind. And when he is discharged in 1946, he comes back to, to the US. And uh, the opportunities are rather limited there. And he has this yearning to go back to France. So he goes back on the GI Bill. Right? He's at the Cité Université. And one of his friends at the Cité Université in, in, in Paris, where many of the students are coming back, was Herb Gentry, whose wife, Marianne Rose Gentry, is in the back there. Hi, Marianne. Herb Gentry was a, a very uh, formidable artist in his own right, and he started a club called Club Gallery, which was partly a club and a gallery at different times of the day, and Duke Ellington and, and Lena Horne and others were attendants. I'm trying to give you a, a feeling of the environment and these intrepid individuals who were coming from the United States and paving a new way, in a sense, creating, a, they were finding their own liberation. They would get to the kind of acclaim or respect that they didn't quite receive. Even those who were fighting for freedom in Europe on behalf of the United States were not able to enjoy those same freedoms in the United States. So many went to France to, and, and of course, you know, Algeria and there were all kinds of other issues going on there. But for them, they felt this was liberating. So Abel felt that this was the period of his apprenticeship. So he went back on the GI Bill. And he started going to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the Grand Jaumet, uh, Academy Julienne, and many of the other art schools where he was learning his craft. And one of the things that's interesting about it is that, um, and I remember having this conversation with uh, Herb Gentry, is that many of the, the artists the, or the, the instructors felt that it wasn't enough for the students to just stay in the classroom. They had to get out there and live. They had to enjoy life, go to the clubs, talk, interact with people and that's where you're going to find the art because as you grow as an individual it comes out through your art so there's more than just one way so abel does this who does he meet he meets people like jean Cocteau, right? he, he starts interacting with a, a variety of different people he found jean Cocteau very interesting and creative uh, he meets another artist another former veteran by the name of um, ellsworth kelly ellsworth kelly uh, is, is coming to Paris, and I remember talking with Ellsworth a, a number of years ago, and he said that his French wasn't that good, but Abel's was impeccable. <laughs> and Ellsworth would, would go to Abel's studio, they would discuss art, they would, uh, and Abel would take him to, to dine at different restaurants and so forth, introduce him to people, and just basically help Ellsworth navigate. That's a story you probably haven't heard, but that's one that was confirmed by Ellsworth in my conversation with him. And so, Abel is now making a home for himself. He decides after a, a period of five years that, okay, that's, the French camp is over, it's time for me to get back to the United States, New York, and strike out on my own. So what he does is that first, um, 
he uh, uh, lands on Christopher Street, that's his first apartment, where he's a, a studio, and he begins working there. Uh, he starts having art shows at the uh, Village Art Center in Greenwich Village. Uh, he begins to uh, have shows at the Sagittarius Gallery, his first major show, a uh, one-man show at the Sagittarius in 1957. And so he continues on, and eventually he decides that um, uh, many of the subject matter that he was exploring at that time were uh, people like, well, let's say, bullfighters, the matadors, uh, they were musicians, and this is what he's getting acclaimed for. And his style is somewhat reminiscent of some of the work that Picasso was doing uh, during the Rose period, and also perhaps the classical uh, period of 1970-1923. And so Abel begins now to, it's an opportunity that comes up in 1961. The United States State Department invites him to travel, and he was the only American in 1961 to travel for the State Department to uh, the U USSR, the former USSR, uh, to places in Central Asia. And that's where he encounters uh, the Islamic influences and in some of the works that you see around this room. One of the examples uh, over here is uh, Far City, the crossing, right there on that wall. Uh, and Leningrad Plaza. Leningrad Plaza, that's right, in Leningrad. All of these are examples of the way in which he's absorbing and taking in the influences of his environment. And I think that um, Abel began to find a passage from many of the people that he saw in their turbans and their robes and so forth, and he was trying to find a way to connect with his own experience. And this came about because during that time, one of the students said to him, in, in uh, I might have been in Moscow, I, I can't remember the exact location, but he said, so, the civil rights movement is going on there. There's all of this uh, activity going on. What is your relationship to that in your work? And Abel thought about it, and he said, well, you know, uh, an artist has the right to you know, speak from their heart, and this is what I do, and, and so forth. And, he, this, and so he was asked, well, how did the student respond? He said, well, I don't think they were quite satisfied with that response. Uh, he said, but that seed was sown. And so, as I say, through Central Asia, he began to see a way to connect with an experience that he remembered from his studies of Delacroix. And that was North African, Delacroix's North African series in Morocco and, and, and other places. And so he found a way to connect with something that he loved, he loved Delacroix, and to connect it with the African experience in North Africa, and eventually found his way to East Africa through some of the imagery that you see. And you can see examples of West Africa in this mask right here. And this was uh, probably a Baule mask from Cote d'Ivoire, from the Ivory Coast. And you can see also, in this particular example here, still life of Tom, the uh, classical influence in his work. And Abel was able to fuse a lot of different traditions and, and, and uh, together. In, don't want to block the viewers over here. But you can see an example of Michelangelo's dying slave, or Adam, you know, the creation of Sistine's That's right, at the Sistine. And you can also see these eight forms, which was for him a symbol of birth and also eternity. There are a lot of geometric forms, and one of the things that might interest you is that Abel would set up his studio at home very much like these scenes that you see here. He would find objects, might find a shell on the beach when he was in the Caribbean, and he would put these things together to create these types of things. And there's something timeless, and there's a fusion of cultures in it. And Abel is a reflection of that fusion of cultures. And we live at a time now when people are, have to recognize, and are recognizing, this interrelationship of cultures and how important it is to communicate and understand one another. Right? not talking past one another. And his work is a perfect example of that. So, after leaving the Soviet Union, he comes back to the United States, more and more Afrocentric elements begin to find their way in his work. Eventually, he travels to the Caribbean. His first trip was to Guadalupe. And there, he begins to use his watercolors and begins to uh, create these environments that are rather 
almost mystical in some ways. You can see in some of the works here, you can feel wind and movement and air, spirit, through his work. You have to remember or, or understand that uh, on 114th Street, there was the church of the Villa Rosa. My mother remembers that very well. And that was a Catholic church, a Catholic Spanish church. And Abel, even though he was not a practicing Catholic, he did attend church, he did attend mass. And he always kept a very spiritual, strong spiritual core uh, throughout him. And it re reflects itself so strongly in his work. So I would say basically to you that um, this renaissance, this rebirth, this coming awareness of Abel is an opportunity for us to interact with each other, to learn more about each other, because Abel is simply the vehicle through which the spirit of understanding, togetherness, beauty, love, all of these, the experience of what it means to be human, sadness, tragedy, rising above that to become more than who we are or who we think we are. And this is the example that I think he sets. And I want to thank all of you for being here because you are all part of the story of our bill tonight. And I thank you and I celebrate you as well. Thank you.